All right, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Thor Willy Rood Hansen. Uh, Dr. Hansen is a professor of pediatrics and neonatology at the Oslo University Hospital and the University of Oslo School of Medicine. Uh, he is a reci recipient of the King's Medal of Merit for his contributions to Norwegian pediatrics and clinical ethics, and he has studied the mechanisms of brain toxicity in jaundiced newborn infants. Thank you. <coughs> First, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me and congratulate both uh, Mike and Tour and indeed Hal for the stick to itiveness that they have displayed in actually putting this together. I know there were a number of steep uphills and you have achieved it, so congratulations. So we're going to be talking about neonatal jaundice and the uh, search for the basic mechanism. S so this is uh, where I, as a clinical neonatologist, might meet a baby, and indeed this is a baby that I rounded on in a NICU in Ethiopia two years ago, and I walked past this baby who, as you can see, is intensely jaundiced and is opistotonic. Now, I don't think this baby survived because no treatment was available in that locale. Now, if that baby had happened to be autopsied, his brain might have looked like this, with intense yellow coloring of the basal ganglia and somewhat more pale yellow color of the rest of the brain. And like I say, likely the baby died. <clears throat> now these are, uh, are brief videos of three children who actually survived in our part of the world and display this phenomenon that we call carnicturus as a form of cerebral palsy that manifests itself with intense chorioacetosis. <coughs> Uh, a neurologist friend of mine describes these <coughs> children as children of normal intellect who are imprisoned in a body they are unable to control. And here's the culprit. See now, can I, oops, can't make it turn around. All right. Well, this is supposed to be a 3D model of the bilirubin molecule, which is the culprit here. It's the byproduct, oh, here it is, rotating, all right. Uh, it's essentially in its normal configuration uh, not soluble in water, but we can do tricks on nature and make it soluble. So here's the conundrum. Neonatal jaundice is extremely common. In fact, all babies do develop jaundice, although we're not able to perceive it with our eyes in all of them. Kernicterus, on the other hand, is extremely rare. Incidence figures from our part of the world is in the range of 40,000 to 150,000 babies. So in other words, you're not just looking for the needle in the haystack, you're looking for the needle in the barn. In Norway, we have been fortunate and have seen only one baby in 600,000 births. Now, in low- and middle-income countries, like the baby from Ethiopia that I showed you, kernicterus is one of the most common causes of cerebral palsy in children. <coughs> so why do some children develop kernicterus at low serum bilirubin levels, whereas others require very high levels to uh, produce this phenomenon? So what questions could we ask? Well, we can ask about the brain entry of bilirubin. Is it just a question of bilirubin concentration? The second conundrum is, why in the world does it end up in the basal ganglia, the localization phenomenon? And what's the impact of the baby being sick? So here is a cartoon I drew some years ago, uh, and essentially trying to illustrate the complexity of the interaction between bilirubin, which circulates in the blood in the jaundiced baby, and getting into the brain. And essentially, the bilirubin in its native ZZ conformation will cross the blood-brain barrier because it behaves essentially like a lipid-soluble molecule. But you can do things with the blood-brain barrier. You can open it, as often happens in a sick baby, for instance, with hyperosmolality, hypercarbia, a sick baby who is septic, all of these things can impact on the balance between bilirubin in the blood and in the brain. <coughs> so
So searching for the basic mechanism uh, leads to the first question, is there indeed a basic mechanism? And one of the questions that makes this difficult is that bilirubin in some ways, in vitro, behaves like a promiscuous inhibitor. It inhibits a lot of interactions. I've played around with this in the test tube for 30 years. And pretty much 95% of interactions that you throw bilirubin into are inhibited. But is that a specific phenomenon or is it an epi phenomenon that doesn't really tell you anything? Another important question is this transient versus permanent effects of jaundice on the brain. All severely jaundiced babies are, uh, uh, they go off their feeds. If you measure their auditory brainstem responses, they are impacted by this. And when the jaundice goes away, the baby is fine. So is this a the, the phenomenon of ending up with connectors is this a stepwise or dichotomous versus a gradual continuous phenomenon. And we know it is reversible, but to which point? We have no way of measuring that point. And, and here's another cartoon that I drew some years ago just to illustrate the large number of neuronal phenomena, uh, physiological as well as biochemical, with which bilirubin has been shown to interact and largely in an inhibitor, uh, inhibitory form. And I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details here for, for lack of time. So what have I, as a uh, simple-minded clinical neonatologist who dabbles in neuroscience, tried to do with this over the years? Well, I've tried to understand the localization phenomenon by manipulating largely with rats and some piglets, trying to impact on bilirubin binding to albumin, to blood flow to the brain, to blood-brain barrier permeability. And I have not, in any of these models, been able to copy the localization phenomenon, and to the best of my knowledge, nor has anybody else. So why we get this intense staining phenomenon, why it ends up or apparently concentrates, we don't know. <clears throat> so I've played around with neurotransmitter metabolism largely in synaptosomes and described a number of infects, effects, once again, largely inhibitory. <clears throat> I've uh, looked at protein phosphorylation, which as you will know is an important regulatory mechanism. Uh, and pretty much 90% of the protein kinase interactions that I have studied in the presence of bilirubin, bilirubin has an inhibitory effect. Then I have tried to look at a phenomenon which was first described in the late 1960s by two Danish researchers who were given the brain of an infant who had just died with acute connectors, and they transected the brain and saw the staining phenomenon that I showed you in a previous slide. And so it was late in the day, they left the lab, came back the next morning, and lo and behold, the coloring was gone. <laughs> and so they tried to understand why this had happened and ended up describing an enzyme-like action uh, resident on the inner mitochondrial membrane of brain cells and um, called it bilirubin oxidase. And I have spent quite a few years trying to find out which enzyme is it. And I'm currently a visiting professor at Stanford uh, for the second time trying to get some help to identify this protein with the help, with the hope that it might help us to understand this variable vulnerability to the toxic effects of bilirubin. And <clears throat> lastly, uh, phototherapy is the most common therapeutic modality employed to treat jaundiced newborns. And that is because photons, when it impinges on the bilirubin molecule, converts it from a lipid-soluble to a water-soluble conformation. And so what we have done here in some infants, trying different kinds of phototherapy, we've looked at 
how large a proportion of the circulating bilirubin in serum will become photoisomerized. And as you will see, just within 15 minutes of turning on the lights, uh, more than 10% of bilirubin is photoisomerized. And we would get to a couple of hours. We're talking about 25. So one out of four bilirubin molecules is now water-soluble. Hypothetically, then, because water-soluble molecules essentially need a transporter to get into the brain, you could speculate that this treatment, before you have a chance to do anything else, is brain protective, and that we're still struggling to create a model with which to test that hypothesis. So in summary, bilirubin neurotoxicity is still an important global health challenge for newborn brains. The majority of researchers have, like myself, been clinicians dabbling in neuroscience. We know that the tools are available to prevent connectors, but even so, it would be fun if we could understand what happens in the yellow brain and why. Thanks. <clears throat>